in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, so just to bring us up to speed, um, if you would turn your Bibles to chapter 10, so that's, or excuse me, chapter 11, to chapter 11, and as you're opening your Bibles, um, just to bring us up to speed, um, in chapter 9, we had the experience of Paul's conversion. Um, chapter 10, we had the, the experience of, of St. Peter having this vision of, of animals that would have been considered unclean for um, uh, Orthodox Jewish people to eat. Um, the Lord offering him this, this food and then his being called to a Gentile home um, uh, of Cornelius. And, at the, and Peter preached and taught, and, the, and this was a Gentile community. They received the Holy Spirit. They were, received the gift of God, and Peter then baptized. So where we are is Peter, in chapter 11, we're moving back to Peter going back to the community. And what we're going to see... Um, is a conversation that we're going to revisit a couple of times. <clears throat> and that is, um, originally, um, the understanding was that Jesus came for the Jews. That, that Jesus was calling the children of God into a deeper faithfulness. But the, the children of God, were the Jews, were not as receptive as Jesus had hoped. And so he turned his message to one and all. And so now the early Christian, the Christian community, given that at that point the predominant group of people who were a part of this, this community called the Way, they were, they were Jews who converted to Christianity. So if you're a Gentile, do you need to become Jewish before you become Christian? That's the conversation that we're going to enter into today, and we're going to revisit a couple of more times in the Acts of the Apostles. All right? So we're going to first look at um, uh, Peter having to explain to this committee who is upset that Peter um, uh, baptized Cornelius, Cornelius in his household. So we're looking at chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. And Paul is our reader today, so turning it over to Paul. The baptism of the Gentiles explained. Now the apostles and the brothers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles too had accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers confronted him, saying, you entered the house of uncircumcised people and ate with them. Peter began and explained it to them step by step, saying, I was at prayer in the city of Joppa, when in a trance I had a vision. Something resembling a large sheet came down, lowered from the sky by its four corners. And it came to me. Looking intently into it, I observed and saw the four-legged animals of the earth the wild beasts, the reptiles, and the birds of the sky. I also heard the voice of God say to me, Get up, Peter, slaughter and eat. But I said, Certainly not, sir, because nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time a voice came from heaven, a voice from heaven answered, What God has made clean, you are not to call profane. This happened three times, and then everything was drawn up again, into the sky. Just then three men appeared at the house where we were who had been sent to me from Caesarea. The Spirit told me to accompany them without discriminating. These six brothers also went with me and we went, entered the man's house. 
He related to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house saying, Send someone to Joppa and summon Simon, who is called Peter, who will speak words to you by which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift he gave to us, when we came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to be able to hinder God? When they heard this, they stopped objecting and glorified God, saying, God has granted them life giving repentance to the Gentiles too. If, if you were not here two weeks ago, or if you don't remember the story two weeks ago, basically what you have is a revisiting of that same, um, same experience. Um, there is one difference. Does anybody want to make a guess at what that one difference is? No? Um, if you look at verse 17. If then God gave them the same gift he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> Peter is saying, if God gave to Cornelius and his family the same gift of the Holy Spirit that he gave to us when? At Pentecost. So who am I to, you know, deny God? He, is giving, he gave to the Gentiles the very same gift he gave to the apostles and the disciples at Pentecost. So that's the only difference. In the first telling or the first uh, re uh, recounting St. Luke's writings, in late St. Luke's writings, what we have, we don't have him making that connection. So we can imagine that, that Peter, after the experience, was pondering about what had happened to him and made that connection that the Holy Spirit um, came to them at, at Pentecost and came to the, the Gentiles. Um, just a word about pondering. That you, word is used at, uh, in what other set of circumstances? In, in the Gospel of Luke. In the blessed... So that in, at the beginning of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, um, after the angel had come to her and had told her about um, uh, the, the, her to receive the, the Son of God as her, own, as her child, um, she pondered these things. Oh, this was uh, actually, I, I take it back. Um, it was when the, uh, the, um, uh, at the birth of Christ and the coming of, the, of the, the shepherds and the coming of the wise men. She pondered these things in her heart. Sometimes it, we all need to ponder. The point here is that we all need to ponder. We need to, to look at, at not only what's happening in our lives, but what has happened in our lives and ask, the, ask God, where were you there, God? I want to see you in the midst of this joyful moment. I want to see you um, in, um, uh, in the midst of my sorrow. I want to see you in the midst of my loneliness. Because if we, it's, it's only in the pondering that we go, when we go back that we see with 20-20 vision, don't we? So just a, just a word, in this season of Advent, this is a great time to ponder our own life history, and finding the hand of God in it. Okay. Um, in this section, any other comments, questions, observations, things that struck you? Yes, Paul. At the beginning. In verse three. <coughs> Jesus, 
Okay, the, the, so in looking at that passage, um, you entered the house of the uncircumcised and ate with them. This is mimicking. He, this is mimicking what, what had happened with Jesus himself in terms of eating with Matthew, the tax collector, and um, with Zacchaeus, um, who was an unclean. Um, that it's, uh, th there is, you're making the connection that, that, that yes, this is absolutely doing that. It, that, people, that, he is, that Peter was being criticized for the very same thing that Jesus was being criticized for. Which, you know what, isn't a bad thing. You know, if someone says to you, you're always in the church. You're always spending time praying. Just like my Lord. <laughs> it's not a bad thing, you know. So, yeah, but that's, that, that's um, and if you go back up to um, verse, uh, verse 2. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers... So this was a committee of Jewish Christians who, they, they met him. And can you imagine? Have you ever done something and then had a whole group of people meet you at the door going, what did you do? That's, this is essentially what happened. You know, you, you're, because again, we have to remember, we look back on Peter as the first pope, as the, uh, as the head of the church. And, and, and so... Um, there are those of us who would never criticize our present pope for a, a, a decision, a something, an action he takes. But there are those who do, don't they? He shouldn't be talking to those people. Why is he going to that land? How, why did he forgive that person? Why is he allowing this to happen? So, 2,000 years, nothing has changed. That's because we're all human, absolutely, absolutely. We want to be in an exclusive club, that's very true. But it's, it's also <clears throat> something important for, again, to ponder. Um, many of us were, have lived our lives long enough that we knew the church before the Second Vatican Council, and we know the church after the Second Vatican Council. And, and I will close my eyes because I don't want to see any raise of hands. But there are those of us who would prefer to have the bells back or to have um, the mass said in Latin or would prefer the nuns to look like nuns, you know? <coughs> when the Holy Spirit speaks, when God speaks, who are we to challenge the voice of God? Recognize we have our own spirituality, and those things are important, were important to us, and they meant something to us. And that's not discounting that. But if God is asking us to move and to change, the church I'm speaking of, and us individually, but, uh, but the church, as in the Second Vatican Council, when all the bishops came together, and they agreed that this is the direction the church is going in, then... We cannot, we cannot stand in the way of God's progress. Make sense? Okay. It's not to say that, that those things that meant something to us don't still mean something to us and that we don't still get that, that tingle of delight when we go to a church that still rings the bells. By the way, do you know why they used to ring the bells? <laughs> to, to, to wake them up. That's essentially because... Do you, and with one, a, a very simple uh, way of understanding the Second Vatican Council um, is in an understanding that before the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, as Catholic laity, we were asked to attend. Attend Mass. Attend prayer. Attend to the needs of the church. Okay? Which meant, many of us will remember going to Mass... And Father, and you might have gone to a church that had several altars, and there's a, somebody saying Mass here, and somebody saying Mass here, and over here Father's hearing confession, and, and Aunt Susie is praying her rosary beads, and somebody else is doing novenas, yes? And then all of a sudden, the, 
the bells ring. When do the bells ring? At the consecration. So everything stops so that we can attend to Second Vatican Council, the word that best describes our action as laity in the church is we are asked to participate. So we shouldn't need the bells to wake us up anymore because we should be in, be in prayer with the with priest, with what's going on on the altar, with the word of God throughout the entire time, not just at the consecration. It got... The, the Holy Spirit, God through the Holy Spirit, challenged the church in the 1960s to recognize our participation is very important. It's not enough just to show up, but we need to participate in our own faith experience. Okay? Um, that was kind of a little bit uh, an aside from, but it, it relates to um, the Holy Spirit leading Peter to something, which then leads the church to a decision which we will read about in, in um, chapter 15 of Acts. Um, any, other last, any other comments, questions, concerns about this section? Yes, ma'am. That Peter did what? Peter's experience. Peter's parallels, experience. Parallels, right. Parallels Jesus' experience. Right, we get criticized for, for. Absolutely, that in the same way that Peter's experience parallels Jesus, our experience should parallel Jesus's as well. We should be criticized for hanging out with the homeless, um, with those dirty people, um, uh, hanging out with the, uh, the teenagers. How can you stand working with the teens? We should just put them in a pickle barrel and seal it up. <laughs> That's actually Mark Twain. That's what Samuel Clement said. That, that all teenagers should, that all children should be put in a pickle barrel. And when they become teenagers, we should just seal it up with an air hole. But we, if, again, if someone criticizes you for doing what you know Jesus did, then you know what? Gold star. You know, you are doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. And it's, it's agitating those around you. Um, the, the scriptures, I've said this before, I'll say it again. Scriptures are meant to comfort us in our afflictions. And it does, doesn't it? But it's meant to afflict us in our comfort. So if what we're doing is afflicting someone, making them uncomfortable, and we're doing it because we know this is what Jesus would have done, more power to us. All right, we're going to move on. Um, uh, chapter 11, verse 19 to 26. 19 to 26. The church at Antioch. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that arose because of Stephen went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but Jews. There were some Cypriots and Cyrenians among them, however, who came to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks as well, proclaiming the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to go to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced and encouraged them all to remain faithful to the Lord and firmness of heart. For he was a good man, filled with the Holy Spirit and faith. And a large number of people was added to the Lord. Then he went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a large number of people. And it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. Anything, did you notice anything? Anything strike you? Any questions about what you read? The hand of the Lord? The hand of the Lord? In, what, in what verse? 21. In verse 21. 
The hand of the Lord was with them. Do you want to say more about it? Jesus holding, this is your vision of Jesus holding his hands over everyone. I, everything is in control, I have this all for you. Okay, yeah, absolutely. You know, the hand of the Lord. In, in, in Catholic sacraments, you know, hands are a, a part of the sacramental experience. The baptizing with water, the placing of oil, the bishop, you know, his hands imposed over the confirmande. Um, you know, when you get anointed, hands, your hands are anointed. So the hand of God, this is, this is action happens with our hands. So God's action was with them in, as they traveled to these cities. That and all of these people were well, hold on. This is a confirmation that this is a true miracle. That all these people were converted from something that they were entrenched in and then became open to this new idea of love. Yeah, so so that, that, that they were converted uh, from what they were entrenched in um, to, to be open to loving all people. Absolutely. Absolutely. That the message of our faith is meant for everyone. If you'll notice at the bottom <clears throat> where it says, uh, verse 26. Um, at the, um, uh, ver the very last part of that verse. In Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Okay? <clears throat> um, the, uh, why, um, this goes back, well, okay, let me take a step forward and then I'll come back. Um, we're called, as a Catholic faith community, we're called Catholics. Do you know what the word Catholic means? Very good. Boy, you guys have been listening. Universal, absolutely. Which means that we, we encompass all the world, but we encompass all people. There is no one that shall be denied faith in Jesus Christ. Knock on our door, we will open it to you. Um, and so this is being, lived, this is being uh, shown us an, an example that it was, if you'll notice, I, it actually struck me. I hadn't really seen this the first, time I, first couple of times I read through this. But in verse 19, um, that uh, uh, preaching the word to no one but the Jews. Okay? But then in the next verse, it says that they began to speak to the Greeks as well, which would be Gentiles. So it's open to all. Okay, <clears throat> going back to and back on verse uh, 26, where it's, where about Christians, um, it's it is a tradition with a small t to think that um, that it was Barnabas and and uh, Saul who named the Christian community as such. Um, but uh, quite honestly, we don't know who, who came up with the, t the term. There are some scholars who believe that um, the group community named themselves. Because do you remember what the, um, earlier in Acts, we heard of that early Christian community, what, that, that they named themselves something. Do you remember what they named themselves? The way. Okay, but this was a predominantly Jewish group of people. So this group of, this community, which is now both Jew and, and Gentile is, doesn't want to, they want to uh, express themselves as, as a community. They, they want to, not to disassociate, but they want to get a little bit of distance from, from embracing too much Judaism. So th some scholars believe that they actually named themselves Christians. It could be, a third um, uh, possibility is that the outlying community seeing this group of people say and and named them Christians because they they were so similar to Jesus Christ himself that makes sense it would <clears throat> it would be like um, uh, and I I didn't see it often but there was a couple of times that during the political campaign that a reporter talked about a group of people as uh, Trumpites Trumpsters, you know, 
So making that connection, you're living a life in such a way that you are easily identified as your, by, by who you are following. Yes, ma'am. Right. It says a term of derision meaning of the party of Christ. Uh, uh, so in your Bible, it, it says that it was uh, a term of derision, yeah. <coughs> meaning of, the of Christ. Christ. So here, here's, another, here's a third opinion, that, that whoever was editing the notes for the, for the Bible that you're working with, that they somehow came across information that, that it wasn't meant as a positive thing. It was meant, oh, you're one of those. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, but it's, so it could be seen as a, again, scholarship is, uh, there are some things that, that, that scholarship knows for certain. But there, a lot of it is educated guesses and opinions. That's why uh, 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 in my notes and in our conversation, I try to give you, if there are more than one opinions, usually they, right at this point, there's, there's a lot of things that they all say, you know, this means this and this means that and that. But there are times when, depending on who I'm reading, will say, oh no, this was, it was Peter, uh, Peter or Paul and Barnabas who gave them the name. Oh no, it was the community that named themselves such. Oh no, it was the, the, uh, the people, the group, the Christians themselves took on that name. And here's a, third opi a fourth opinion is that, it, yeah, it was the outside community, but it wasn't meant to be a compliment. It was meant to be uh, an accusation of maybe craziness or something. Okay. <laughs> Any anything anything else strike you? Yes, but Paul. So you're looking at the at the city names, and you looked at a map. Right. Cyprus is in the Mediterranean. Antioch is 400 miles from Jerusalem. Cyrene, Cyrene is 500 miles from Jerusalem, right, on the African coast, northern coastline. So in a year, you know, walking, you can do, what, 20 miles a day, you can walk to these people, when 500 miles away, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, So Paul's comment was, is that, that the idea that, that 500 miles away, knowing that the predominant way of travel was by foot, that and if you travel 20, 20 miles a day, which was about average, then, it, you know, yeah, they've gone a long ways um, and with some of them coming back. But, it sh but remember at the, in, in the, er, the um, a few chapters ago in Acts, the persecution and that the early commu the community dispersed because of the, of the persecution. And so... Um, th these are some of the places that, that that community dispersed to. Some of, you know, they went to uh, Cyrene, they went to Cyprus, they went to Antioch. Th this is, so they, they needed to settle someplace where they felt they would not receive persecution. What we're going to see is that that persecution is going to um, expand out. And so eventually these places won't be safe either. But they're seeking freedom. They were seeking, um, in the same way the pilgrims came here to, to, the, to North America, uh, so as to escape persecution of their faith. So they have the freedom to, to celebrate their faith the way they believe they should, or live their faith the way they should. The, was that? Yeah, it's just that it shows that people will go to great lengths uh, for what they believe. And they're willing to do that. Yeah. Yeah, so that, yes, it, that, that, yeah, absolutely, we, that we will go to great lengths to live our faith, but, but there are those who f also feel the c compelled to go back once, once they've had that faith experience or that lived experience to go back and say, you know what, you should do it this way. You should come and live with us. Yeah. Any, any other observations? Um, I, if you look at verse 20, I just want to make a quick point. Um, 
at the end of that verse, it says, um, uh, proclaiming the Lord Jesus. Now, just to, um, we're not speaking of Lord in the sense of a title, like Lord Byron. When they, in scripture, when we read the word Lord Jesus, Lord and God, they're, they're proclaiming Jesus as their Lord, their God. Okay. Um, and in verse 22, I just, uh, another small thing, but I just want you to um, <coughs> hold on to this because it will make, it'll, I'll bring something up later on in, in further chapters. Um, verse 22, um, when they're, they're sending, um, reach the ears of the church in Jerusalem, they sent who? So Barnabas is in charge. Barnabas is, they, and, and why are they sending Barnabas? Because in the same way, the, the church to this day, if they hear, um, let's say, um, uh, we start a, a, a spiritual experience. Teresa's temple of temptation, okay? <laughs> and, and it gets back to Archbishop Vigneron that there is this, this community of people who are Catholic who are living in the spirit in a, uh, in a different new way. So what would the Archbishop be, be um, obliged to do? Check it out. Because if they're making a connection that these people are living in, in the Word of God and they're Catholic, we want to make sure that they're Catholic and not just Teresa's temple. Make sense? So they're sending Barnabas, but Barnabas is in charge. That's something I want you to hold on to. Um, okay, any other last comments? Just a quick question. At what point does Saul become Paul? Good, uh, so the question is, at what point does Saul become Paul? Hold on to that question because we'll find out here in Scripture. In my notes, I put Saul, Paul, because I want people to understand that they're the same guy. But... Um, uh, and sometimes I'll just say Saul and sometimes I'll just say Paul. But we're going to get to a point in which Paul makes it, we will, it will, all we will read in scripture is the name Paul. So it's almost like a demarcation line. Everything from that point back, he's Saul. But everything from that point on, he's Saul. Or he's Paul, excuse me. And, and scholars believe that, that Paul made the choice to do that as, so he would be more relatable to the Gentiles. All right. All right. Um, so we're going to move on to verses um, 11, or verse 27 to the end of the chapter. Um, the prediction of Agabus. At that time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine all over the world. And it happened under Claudius. So the disciples determined that according to ability, each should send relief to the brothers who lived in Judea. This they did, sending it to the presbyters in the care of Barnabas and Saul. Um, any any observations, comments? Does something strike you? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. So making the connection to Joseph and his Technicolor dream coat, um, but that that Joseph ha uh, receiving dreams and visions and being told by God that there is a famine and to store up to you know. Yeah, it also, um, our, the Catholic Church is, <laughs> when there is a disaster, there are many organizations that, that respond. Red Cross, you know, is, uh, but what is one of the main groups to respond to any kind of natural disaster? Catholic Charities, Catholic Church. We're, excuse me, one of the very first organizations to respond immediately. So we can see 
that that has begun, that's, that's all the way back to the Acts of the Apostles. So the first century, we have been one of those organizations to see to the needs of others. Um, and Agabus is having had this vision, um, uh, ex experience like Joseph of knowing that, that something is coming. Um, what we don't know is if Agabus was in Antioch or if Agabus was in Jerusalem and then went to Antioch. Okay? Um, but the, he's, either way, he's asking the people of Antioch who are not experiencing the famine to gather relief funds so that, that someone can then take that back to, to the community in Jerusalem and provide for their needs. Um, let's, yes, ma'am. Okay, you have to leave it a quarter to... Okay. Um, next time tell me tell, next time tell me before we start okay I will not take offense if anybody needs to leave in the middle of the conversation that's I understand that you hate to we hate to see you go um, verse 30 in ver oh yes sir uh, so uh, they so in in um, um, uh, Give me the verse where it says prophet. 27. Oh, that, at, that, at that time, some prophets. Um, and Dan's comment was, I thought there were no prophets after John the Baptist. Um, the, uh, the understanding of prophecy is different, um, Old Testament, New Testament. So, the, so with John the Baptist, he was the last to receive direct messages from God as, as a, a, a lay person. So prophets, so one way to look at this, these were prophets with a capital P. Each one of us in our baptisms were, were baptized prophet, priest, and king. Um, meaning that we are meant to be a royal people, we are meant to be the children of God. As priests, we are meant to be leaders of our faith uh, before others. And thirdly, we are meant to, to seek to understand God so well in our own lives that we would know how God would want this moment to be. So a simple example of that. Hopefully at this point in our lives, we know when we see the, on the TV screen um, uh, the, 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 uh, some disaster has occurred. And we know this isn't what God wants. Rather than saying, God, why did you allow this to happen? Our thought should be, this is not what God wants. Um, prophet, prophecy in the sense of having a, a, an understanding of God's will uh, so well um, that, that we, we understand how God would want us to be and, and to act. But there is also an element of that in God's, so these are prophets with a small p, we're all small, prophets with a small p, but there are, all, there are still those occasions when God whispers in the ears of people something that is about to happen or something that is going on. Does that make sense? So it's not the same prophecy that of, a, of Ezekiel or uh, Elijah, uh, not Elijah, Ezekiel or... Um, Isaiah, um, but it's, yes, it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, it's not a, the big capital P, but it's prophecy in the sense that um, of both knowing what God would want, but at times God whispers into our ears and says, this is what, you know, take this, do that, go there. We've had those moments, and you, and you, you hear of uh, stories of people that, there was a, uh, went, went through the internet for a while. Uh, you know how people will email you these stories about this, this person who was driving home from, uh, from work one day and just had it on his heart that he needed to buy two gallons of milk. Have you the story? Needed to buy two gallons of milk. Just didn't drink milk, probably were lactose intolerant themselves. <laughs> but they went and bought two gallons of milk. As they're leaving the grocery store, 
there is a mother with three children literally counting pennies as she's going into the grocery store, knowing that her funds are so limited, she's only going to be able to buy certain things. And that person realizing that voice that whispered in my ear gave the milk to the mother, who then cries out of gratitude. So prophecy in that sense. And, 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 and you're saying to yourself, well, how come I never get those moments? Uh, the challenge is maybe because we're not listening. Maybe because our lives are so noisy that we're, we're, not, we're not allowing ourselves to hear those whispers of God. Or maybe we've heard those whispers of God and have made a decision sometime in our life that, oh, that's just crazy. Because I, I don't know about you, but I have had those moments in my life where I've thought to do something, I thought, oh, no. What, what, what? They'll think I'm nuts, yeah. right? So, uh, and yes, they do sometimes. <laughs> but we don't know what seed we've planted. We don't know what seed we've planted. So, again, it's, you know, the idea of prophecy is hearing those whispers of God. Because we're all meant to be prophets. We're all meant to proclaim Jesus, the coming of Jesus Christ. We're in the season of Advent. We're, this is a time when we're, we're supposed to be remembering as Catholics, guess what, people? He's coming back. This is, it's, this, it's not just a one-time deal. The world is going to come to an end, and we need to get ready for that. We need to get the world ready for that. Okay? Does that... Um, Anything else? Yes, Paul. Verse. Verse 27. Oh, coming down. Yeah. Um, so the question, the, 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 so you're making an observation, it seems like an a, 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 um, uncomfortable set of words, given that Antioch is actually north. Um, uh, you're thinking in first world, um, 20th century, because we have a p picture of the globe, right? We know what is north, what is south, what is east, what is west. Um, in in first, the first century, Yes, Jerusalem was the center of the universe. You know, that for a, a believing person, and for some people to this day, all, all life begins in Jerusalem, all life will end in Jerusalem. Um, it's not what the Catholic Church teaches, but, you know, that's, that's some people's beliefs. So the idea of going down from, it's, it's rather than a geographical, it's a hierarchical. From I am at the epic epicenter of the universe, and now I'm going to a lesser place. One way to look at it. Yes, Marsha. I thought geologically it was of a higher elevation, and that's why they always said go up to Jerusalem. To come down from Jerusalem. It is higher elevation. And and uh, thank you for pointing that out. That it is that the idea of that Jerusalem was at a higher elevation, and that's a part of it. That's absolutely a part of it too. That if you're if you're up. You're going, you're, you're on a mountain, you're going to go down to, so it's both a spiritual and literally a physical. So thank you for, for pointing that out. See, scripture scholars, we're all scholars here. Um, okay, um, moving on to, uh, just want to make sure. Um, oh, you know, I just, one final little comment. Um, uh, in verse 30, where it says, uh, this they did, sending it to the presbyters. What would be another word for presbyters? Priests, right. Um, but you will notice in the New Testament um, that for the most part, priests refer to the priests of the temple, the Jewish priests of the temple. Um, we, uh, we use, we, sometimes, and especially in, in an old English way, uh, in prayers, it'll say the presbyters of the church today, meaning the priests of the church. Um, but, they, but 
so as to not confuse those in leadership in the Christian community with those of the temple. Um, the authors will, will rarely use priests to mean anything other than the priest of the Jewish temple. All right, um, we are now moving into chapter 12, verses 1 through 19. All right, and... Okay. Um, here... Herod's persecution. Herod's persecution of the Christians. About that time, King Herod laid hands on some of the members of the church to harm them. He had James, the brother of John, killed by the sword. And when he saw this was pleasing to the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. It was a feast of the unleavened bread. He had him taken into custody and put into prison under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. He intended to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter thus was being kept in prison, but prayer by the church was fervently being made to God on his behalf. Okay, we're going to take this, in this, this next part in sections, so just verses uh, 1 through 5. Um, anything strike you? Stand out? Um, Herod, this Herod, uh, in the same way that, that when Rome was in power, Caesar, there was, you know, Caesar Augustus, Caesar this, Caesar that. Um, Herod was a very was not used as a title, but there were lots of Herods. Um, the, there was the Herod that was that uh, was alive when Jesus was born and was responsible for the death of the Holy Innocents. There was the Herod that was in power, um, and that would have been so. Herod the Great was uh, when Jesus was born. The next Herod was his son, and he was one who was there when Jesus was crucified. This Herod is probably a cousin of that other Herod. Um, uh, or could be a nephew. Um, and um, just uh, something that I uh, include in my notes from the, from the Ignatius Catholic Bible study, that Herod was a sophisticated type of person, this Herod. So bent on consol consolidating his power that he had become a master of intrigue and a total opportunist. For li largely political motives, he practiced Judaism with a certain vigor. So this particular Herod um, is seeing his, his role as gaining more power if he just really embraces the practices of, of the Jewish faithful at the time. Um, and so, and, and it gets affirmed, how? Because he has James killed. And this James, we're going to run into a different James later on in Acts. This James is the James, the brother of John. So John and James, which are called the brothers of thunder, was one of the apostles. Okay? Um, and he's killed by a sword, which means he's beheaded. Okay? Um, uh, just one other, one other uh, reflection. Um, the Feast of Passover, again, this is when we talk about how do scholars figure out things about the authors who are writing, and this is one of those moments. Um, some scholars suggest that, what, that this period of time is not, um, is not pass, it's not actually the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but it's actually Passover. And that St. Luke, as a Gentile, doesn't understand that they're two different things. There, were, for, uh, there was a time in my, my life, I've even said, Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread are actually the same thing. And they're not. Um, and and I, I still stand confused to some degree because in my researching the Feast of Unleavened Bread, um, some, say, some say it is the seven days before Passover. Some, and these are Jewish sites that I went to, some say it's the seven days after Passover. But it is attached to Passover in the same way that we would have um, Advent connected to Christmas. 
It's a period of time in which there is a specific matter in hand. So Passover is the remembrance of when the, the angel of death passed over the Israelites while they were in slavery in Egypt, killing the first and those, uh, uh, the, uh, not the Israelites, but all of those in Egypt, killing the firstborn except for those who had taken and sacrificed an unblemished lamb and painted the doorpost with the blood, okay, the blood of the lamb. Where do we hear the blood of the lamb referred to? Jesus Christ. He, he is what saves us. So that's Passover. That's the celebration of Passover. Either before or after, we have uh, seven days in which uh, it is the task of the household to clean the house of all unleavened bread, or all unleavening, all leavening, excuse me, to clean the household of all leavening. So that certainly would be bread. Um, it would also mean, what other things have leaven in them? Cra some crackers, some cheeses, some beer. <laughs> Figures you would be the one to say beer. <laughs> beer, m some alcohols, donuts, pancakes, waffles, some breakfast cereals, and if you have, in our day and age, if you, have, if you would have baking powder or baking soda, those are leavening agents. So in an Orthodox Jewish household, they spend seven days literally cleaning all leavening out. And it's symbolic. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a remembrance, yes, of God saying to the Israelites, you're going to have to move quick. So when you make this bread, don't put any leavening in it. Okay? So it's the idea of that we are called to be a pilgrim people, that it, we're not meant to get too stationary. All right? It's also symbolic, the leavening is symbolic of, of sin. And it's the idea that we're meant to clean sin out of our lives so that we are freed, we are liberated to follow God. So that's, that's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But, it, but we don't, we, scholars, most scholars believe that what, what uh, St. Luke is referring to this period of time is actually Passover. Okay? That, that, uh, um, that James was killed and that Peter was arrested. Um, okay. Um, verse 4, when it says four squads of soldiers... So a squad of soldiers are four. A squad of soldiers are four soldiers. So Peter had four squads of four soldiers guarding him in prison. This would be basically maximum security. Okay. Now, in the Roman army, when you were asked to guard a prisoner, you were never asked to guard a prisoner alone. There were usually a squad that guarded, and. Um, if you fell asleep, uh, no, let me put it this way. Uh, you were in deep, deep trouble if you fell asleep. And, and we'll, as um, we will read later on, um, uh, they were killed because they allowed Peter to escape. It's not just the guy who fell asleep, but everybody in that squad. So my responsibility is not only to keep myself awake, but to make sure all of you stay awake too. Okay, so that's why you have a spear, you know. Stay awake, stay awake. Yeah. So, um, uh, so four squads of four soldiers. Peter is in maximum security here. Um, and, but in verse 5, Peter thus was being kept in prison, but prayer by the church, fervently being made to God on his behalf. If, you're, if you have some uh, uncertainty about um, uh, 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 intercessory prayer, this would be a good verse to reflect on. Okay? Um, okay? Excuse me. Can I have a paper? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, again, for f future reference, please ask before we start the class. No, you're fine. You're fine. But please ask before we start. Okay, I'm sorry. 
You're forgiven. Okay. So we're going to move on. We're going to move on um, to uh, uh, verse 6 through 19. On the very night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter, secured by double chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while outside the door guards kept watch on the prison. Suddenly the angel of the Lord stood by him, and the light shone in the cell. He tapped Peter on the side and awoke, awakened him, saying, Get up quickly. The chains fell from his wrist. The angel said to him, Put on your belt and your sandals. He did so. Then he said to him, Put on your cloak and follow me. So he followed him out, not realizing what was happening through the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first guard, then the second. Then they came to the iron gate leading out of the city, which opened for them by itself. They emerged and made their way down the alley, and suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter recovered his senses and said, now I know for certain that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people. Had <clears throat> oh, sorry. <laughs> the Jewish people had been expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary and the mother of John, who is called Mark, and there were many people gathered in prayer. When he knocked on the gateway door, a maid named Rhoda came to answer it. She was so overjoyed when she recognized Peter's voice <coughs> that instead of opening the gate, she ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the gate. They told her, you are out of your mind. But she insisted that it was so. But they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued to knock. And when they opened it, they saw him and were astounded. He motioned to them with his hand to be quiet and explained to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison and said, Report this to James and the brothers. Then he left and went another place. At daybreak, there was no small commotion among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. Herod, after instituting a search but not finding him, ordered the guards tried and executed. Then he left Judea to spend some time in Caesarea. The end of the, the, uh, the guards. Okay. Um, observations, comments. What, what strikes you? So the second James that we have um, um, uh, in verse... I have to look... Um, verse 17 um, the, yeah hold on my eyes are not what they used to be he summoned them with his hand um, and said report this to James and the brothers um, though this is not the same James um, <clears throat> this James is uh, so the James that, we, that was executed by beheading at the beginning of this chapter um, was the brother of John, the, 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 the sons of, of thunder. Um, this James, most scholars suspect, um, had a relationship to Jesus. They, there is a belief that he was the stepbrother of Jesus. And he becomes the first bishop of Jerusalem because Peter now has left. So this James is actually the first uh, person to be in leadership, to take leadership of Jerusalem um, with, that's not an apostle. Uh, so it's not the same James, it's a different James. Um, uh, and it is believed that, that this James was the stepbrother of Jesus. So how could Jesus have stepbrothers? Huh? Yes, yeah, so Joseph... Um, <clears throat> We don't know because we don't have a lot of information. Um, but we, we do know that, that, that um, if we, if in, um, I think it's Jude, let's see, let me find. Um, 
yeah, Jude chapter 1, verse 1, um, he is, I, this James is identified as the brother of, of Christ, of Jesus. <clears throat> so the, the general understanding, or the general um, un belief is that Joseph was an older gentleman, that when he married Mary, we as a Catholic faith, we believe that Mary remained ever virgin. She conceived as a virgin, she remained virgin after the death of Christ. Yet, wait a minute, but she's married to Joseph. So, you know, if they're, uh, how does that represent well a married couple? Um, the belief is, is that, that, uh, that Joseph was actually an older gentleman who um, was married and had children by his first wife. Um, what was the, the main cause of women's death up until about 200 years ago? Childbirth. So we don't know, um, but the suspicion, uh, the belief is, is that if this is true, Joseph's first wife died. And that he was not looking for a wife in the sense of having marital relations, but was looking for someone to help raise his children, who were still relatively young. And so, um, so, the, the, so Jesus would have had stepbrothers and stepsisters, if this theory is, is true. And in that, I would free Joseph to be a, pers uh, a person of devout prayer. Um, it would also explain why when Christ begins his public ministry, we never hear of Joseph. And it's likely because him being older than Mary had passed away by the time Jesus began his public ministry. It's also important to understand that why would, because we also have in, in, uh, in the Gospels where, where Jesus People, Jesus is preaching, and the people of, of the community say, we know your brothers. We know your sister. We know, you know, who are you to tell us? So it helps to explain that as well. Um, and in the time of Christ, they did not have terminology for cousins or terminology for stepbrothers and sisters. It, you, you were a brother or a sister. You, you, you were a part of a family. You were, you were treated as everybody else was. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> so yes, this is a different James. Yes, ma'am. Verse 19. That's Peter. So it says, so we have at the beginning of verse 19, Herod, after instituting a search but not finding him, ordered the guards tied, tried, and executed. New sentence. Then he left for Judah. The he is Peter, not Herod. So Herod did not go to Judah. Peter left for Judah. So Peter leaves the area for fear of his own life. Yes, ma'am. Oh, did you want to say more? And that's when James becomes bishop. James, the stepbrother of Jesus, becomes bishop of Jerusalem. Because we, don't, we, we know that Peter will return to Jerusalem. Um, because in, in chapter 15, we will have the first council of Jerusalem. And Peter will be present at that. Um, but most scholars think that this was when Peter actually began his public ministries. When he went out into the mission field um, uh, to beyond Jerusalem. I mean, he was always a part of the missionary work of the church. But now he's taking it beyond um, Jerusalem and out. And here he goes to Judea. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so yours actually identifies it as Herod. Most scholars say this is Peter. Most scholars will say it's Peter. <coughs> okay. Um, any other observations or? So an angel appearing. Uh, when, in looking at this passage, there are there are some connections to another point in history. Um, in, uh, uh, of our, our belief history, and that is to the Exodus experience. So here is Peter imprisoned. Here are the Israelites imprisoned in slavery. Peter is in a physical prison. They're in a physical prison, but it's a slavery. An angel appears. Angel of death over, comes over the, 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 um, the Egyptians 
Peter has an angel come to him. Um, let's see. Um, well, let me just read this. Peter will later describe that he was rescued by the hand of Herod, which is similar to the Israelites being rescued from the hand of their enemy. So, in, uh, so Peter says, I, you know, in, it says in here that in, chap in verse 11 that Peter was rescued from the hand of Herod where, and the Egyptians from the hand of their enemy. In verse 17, Peter was brought out of bondage, um, which is the same language used in Exodus regarding the Israelites. They were brought, they were freed from bondage. And the angel of the Lord addressed Peter and told him, dress yourself and put on your sandals, this is verse 7, reminding us of the command of the angel telling the Israelites, now prepare to, you know, put on your sandals, be ready to leave. Put your tunic on, eat your meal, do not eat your meal sitting down, it's the idea that you need to get ready to leave, all right? Um, so there is that connection between, uh, Luke is helping us to realize God acts in human history. God takes care of us in, in our history. And, and it happened back in Exodus, it's happening now again for Peter. Um, if you look at verse 12, um, then they real, when he realizes he went to the house of Mary. Scholars uh, say this is not Mary the mother of God. This is another Mary, an, uh, uh, one of the, the early believers uh, in faith, that she is likely the mother of John Mark. <clears throat> John Mark is the author of the Gospel of Mark. Um, some scholars suggest that, that it was Mary's home that held the upper room where they had the Last Supper. But she was, uh, the belief being that there's nothing substantiates this in scripture, but educated guess is that she was probably a widow of some financial substance. And so was able to support, had a large home, um, and was able to support, um, uh, and, and had heard Jesus at some point and come to belief, so supported his apostles and continued to support the early Christian community. Uh, that would be where they gathered for their, their time of prayer and, and conversation. All right? Yeah, and and uh, uh, no, Rhoda, Rhoda is the, is the servant. Um, verse 13, uh, so when Peter knocks on the door, uh, he, uh, knocked on the gateway door, a maid named Rhoda, so you thought Mary Tyler Moore's neighbor. She was a Mary. Huh? Yeah, Mary and Rhoda. <laughs> yeah, so, Ro so Rhoda, Rhoda was a, a maid. And, 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 and I, I, in my own mind, and it's, 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 it's a healthy thing, huh? It's a healthy thing sometimes to get into the scriptures and allow it, allow your imagination to play with it. So in my prayer on this, I see Rhoda as a very, like a, like a 10 year old girl, you know, who is, it just hasn't, doesn't have sense yet. So she sees, it's like Pope Francis knocking on your door and you, oh, and you close the door and you, guess who's here? <laughs> you slam the door in his face, you know, guess who's here? Uh, yeah, so Ro Rhoda was the maid, not uh, the maid of Mary, um, who was not the mother of God. Um, anything else about this passage? So we are going to um, finish off the chapter. Uh, so we're going to look at verse um, 20. Or Herod's death. He had long been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon who now came to him in a body. After winning over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they sued for peace because their country was supplied with food from the king's territory. On that appointed day, Herod, attired in royal robes and seated on the rostrum, addressed them publicly. The, ass the assembled crowd cried out, this is the voice of God, not a man. 
At once the angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not ascribe the honor of God. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God continued to spread and grow. Mission of Barnabas and Saul. After Barnabas and Saul completed their relief mission, they returned to Jerusalem, taking with them John, who is called Mark. Um, I want to read something again from another commentary about Herod. And this was actually uh, from the history, the first century historian Flavius Jos Josephus, um, who recorded Herod's... Um, he recorded this moment in, uh, of Herod, and he wrote, he said, And presently his flatterers cried out, one from one place, another from another, although not uh, for his good, that he was a god. And they added, be, be thou merciful to us, for although we have hitherto uh, reverenced thee only as a man, yet shall we henceforth own thee as a superior to mortal nature. So essentially they're saying, they said, we, we saw you as a man before, but now we see you as a god. Upon this the king did neither rebuke them or reject their impious flattery. A severe pain also arose in his belly and began in a most violent manner. And when he, was, he had been quite worn out by the pain in his belly for five days, he departed this life. So that's from the historian, um, first century historian Flavius Joseph, um, giving, you know, but you can imagine this is, this, this Herod, who, as I read earlier, was saying how, you know, he was somebody who really was trying to, to get as much power and prestige as he possibly can, to the point that he even dressed the part um, in, in verse 21. On the appointed day, so this delegation has come, Herod says, wait, uh, I will receive you tomorrow or whenever. And then on that appointed date, Herod arrived in royal robes and seated on a rostrum addressed them publicly. Um, the same jo uh, uh, Flavius Josephus described that whatever it was that he was wearing um, uh, was Silver, it was a silver garment that reflected the sun, the light of the sun. So, you know, can, can you imagine him sitting high upon, uh, upon his throne and he is literally just sparkling before their eyes. So you can imagine a group of people coming in and just being overwhelmed by what they see and now proclaiming him as God. And Herod, rather than saying, oh, no, no, no. What he said was, oh, no, 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 okay? And is struck dead for his, 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 his ego. Yeah, and that death does not really sound really good. Um, what is it? Uh, in verse uh, 23, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Truth is, people, we're all going to be eaten by worms. Um, and our, uh, that we have enough um, uh, bacteria in our bodies that, that without embalmment, we decay very quickly. You yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> have a nice lunch. <laughs> have a nice lunch. <laughs> but it, it's, it, it, is, it reminds us that this is not our home. This is not our home. We are meant for the, for the, the kingdom of God. And, and that what we think is permanent is only temporary. Um, you've all heard this before. No one had a U-Haul following a hearse. You know, no one took, yes, the pharaohs had it all put into, the, into their crypts, but quite frankly, they were dead. They didn't get to enjoy any of it. Um, so it, it's a, that, that we're a pilgrim people. Um, the final passage about the mission of Barnabas and Saul um, you know, that, that um, completed their relief mission. They returned to Jerusalem, taking with them John, who was called Mark. Um, so this, again, is John Mark. Uh, and we're going to hear more about this, John, this Mark, this John, um, because Paul is not going to have a, or Saul is not going to have a real favorable opinion of Mark. 
and uh, he is going to end up going home um, in, in terms of um, uh, the mission trip that he, will, uh, that he is going on. All right. Um, any last comments, questions, concerns? So um, I <coughs> we're going to go into prayer. Um, I don't know how to, to officially end the tape so that we can then go into, because our, our prayer, for those of you who are online, our prayer is a prayer of, of, inter, of um, um, uh, prayers of petition throughout the community, and you're not going to hear everybody's prayer. So um, why don't we just end with the sign of the cross, and then we'll go into our own private prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.